Jesus, our Messiah, was Jewish. He lived a Jewish life. He was a Jewish rabbi teaching Jewish people in a style that was familiar to them. So is it possible to miss the true meaning of what Jesus said without investigating his Jewish roots and connecting ourselves to his words? Welcome to Engrafted, a show dedicated to uncovering and teaching the Jewishness of Jesus. Shalom and welcome to Engrafted, this week filming in picturesque Richmond, Virginia. My name is Alan Berner, and while I'm not a Jew, I'm a Gentile believer in Jesus the Messiah and study the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. I incorporate the Torah into my daily life and consider myself to be a Messianic Hebrew. Along with my wife, Jackie, we delve into the Holy Scriptures to help you grow in your understanding of the Hebrew roots of the church and how it affects you. We took a weekend getaway to the big city for a little downtime and thought it might be fun to bring you along. This week's Torah portion tells the story of Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, visiting the camp of Israel. It also tells about God meeting with Moses at, on Mount Sinai, where he gave the people the Ten Commandments. God also invites his chosen people to enter a special covenant relationship with him. It's this relationship and some of the elements of the ceremony there near the mountain that we want to examine today on Engrafted. In Exodus 19, verse 5, we hear the words of Yahweh where he says, Now, if you will pay careful attention to what I say and keep my covenant, then you will be my own treasure from among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. Earlier in Exodus 6, verse 7, the Lord told the children of Israel, I will take you for my people, and I will be your God. This phrase is an adaptation of an expression from the sphere of marriage. The ancient Near Eastern wedding formulation was, You will be my wife, I will be your husband. In the Hebrew Bible, it's common to speak of marriage as taking a wife. God likened himself to a suitor and the people of Israel to the young woman he was courting. He was not content to simply redeem them from slavery. He wanted to take them as his very own people and enjoy an intimate relationship with them like that of a husband to a wife. The language used in this passage is covenantal language. God wanted to enter into a covenant with Israel. A covenant is a contractual agreement that specifies the terms and conditions of a relationship. The sages speak of Exodus chapter 19 as God's betrothal of Israel. At the foot of Mount Sinai, God officially asked for Israel's hand in marriage. God spoke to his people lovingly. He reminded the people of how he had carried them out of Egypt as if on the wings of an eagle, and how he had brought them to himself. He promised to make them his own treasure above all other peoples. In Exodus 19, verse 5, he said, You shall be my own possession. The Hebrew word that the New International Standard Bible translates as possession is the word segula. Some versions translate it as beloved treasure or peculiar treasure. In the ancient Near East, the term segula was used to describe a king's prized trophy. When a king's army vanquished an enemy, the king kept the most valuable items for his own treasure. A precious object like this was called a segula. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 5, the word is used as a term of endearment for Israel. God says that he will make the Israelites into his specially prized treasure. He says that even though he owns the entire earth, Israel will always be his special people. This can be compared to a king who has conquered many lands and possessed great wealth. His treasuries were filled with valuables, but he had one precious gemstone that he valued above all others. Rather than leave it in the treasury with the other valuables, he had it hung on a golden chain and wore it around his neck every day. That's the way God looks at Israel and each of us. Every person who turns to him in faith and love is added to his special treasure, his holy people. Beginning in Exodus chapter 19, verse 10, the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Before a traditional Jewish wedding, it's customary for the bride and groom to immerse themselves in a baptism. It's a purity ritual. Both bride and groom want to be ritually fit or pure on their wedding night. In Hebrew, a gathering of water suitable for ritual immersion is called a mikvah. A mikvah may be a river, a lake, or any naturally fed pool of water. In the Torah, the ritual of baptizing oneself in a mikvah is sometimes referred to as washing one's garments. 
Like a bride preparing for her wedding day, the people of Israel immersed themselves before meeting with God at Mount Sinai. Next, in her segment, A Selah Moment, Jackie will introduce another part of a traditional Jewish wedding that also just so happens to show up in our reading at Mount Sinai. Take it away, Jackie. meaning to each step of the process. Everything ties back to God's love for his children and the covenant he's made with them. Alan has been talking today about the Jewish wedding and God's covenant with the Hebrew children. He has taken three words that are important to the wedding ceremony and ties them into our Torah reading. He spent some time explaining the word mikvah. Exodus 19.17 says, and Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. They had been immersed in the mikvah and cleansed of all impurity. They clothed themselves in clean clothes and went to the foot of Mount Sinai like a bride going to meet her bridegroom. This brings us to our second word of the Jewish wedding, the huppah. You can find the huppah referenced in Joel 2.16, which says, let the bridegroom come out of his room and his bride out of her hoopah. Psalm 19.5 speaks of the bridegroom coming out of his hoopah. So what exactly is a hoopah? In a Jewish wedding, the bride and groom are married beneath a canopy called a hoopah. A hoopah can be decorated very extravagantly with lights, flowers, and fine materials. Or it can be very simple a piece of fabric held above the bride and groom by the four corners. All four sides of the hoopah are opened, which symbolizes that their home is always open to visitors. Abraham and Sarah's tent was opened on four sides, a sign of unconditional hospitality. But was there really a hoopah at Mount Sinai? Mount Sinai is sometimes likened to a hoopah. The clouds covered the mountain where God descended and his people stood beneath the mountain. It portrays a beautiful picture of God standing on the mountain under the clouds ready to receive his bride, the Hebrew children, into the hoopah. The books of the Torah unfold many pictures of God's love for his people. This teaching is intended to give you a mental picture of the covenant wedding at Mount Sinai. Now let's go back to Alan. He will give you the third word mentioned in our teaching today, a summary of everything we learned, and give you next week's Torah reading. See you next time on the Salem Moment. So far, we've discovered that in this week's Torah portion, God wanted a special covenantal relationship with His people, Israel. He told His bride to wash her garments, mikvah, a term used to describe a ritual washing ceremony required in traditional Jewish weddings. Jackie helped us see that some rabbis have likened Mount Sinai to a chuppah, the canopy that covers a groom and his bride during a Jewish couple's wedding ceremony. Before we go, I'd like to point out one last thing on this week's episode. It shows up in Exodus chapter 19, verse 20, and reads like this. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. God descended onto Mount Sinai in the midst of smoke, lightning, and a fanfare of trumpet blasts. The mountain trembled before him. The writer of the book of Hebrews described it as blazing fire and darkness and gloom and whirlwind. So terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. It was the great entrance of the groom into the chuppah. In a traditional Jewish wedding, a marriage covenant is read aloud to the bride and the groom as part of the covenant ceremony. This written contract is called a ketubah. The ketubah spells out the terms and conditions incumbent upon the man and the woman. After the ceremony, witnesses sign the ketubah. In Jewish tradition, the ketubah is displayed in the home as evidence that the marriage is legal. In the wedding at Mount Sinai, the Torah is the ketubah. It is the legally binding covenant contract between God and his bride Israel. From atop Mount Sinai that day, God spoke the Ten Commandments to all of Israel. This can be compared to the reading of the ketubah in a wedding ceremony. There's a difference, this is a different way of looking at the commandments of the Torah. We should not think of them as rules imposed by an impersonal government. 
They're more like the wedding vows joyously taken by a blushing bride on her wedding day. If we understand the Torah as a ketubah, we see that it is far more than an ethical system or a moral list of do's and don'ts. Instead, it functions as the sacred marriage covenant between God and his people. It lays out the parameters for the relationship and outlines the expectations. Its specific instructions and stipulations are designed to make the marriage happy, fruitful, and functional. It defines the obligation of both the husband and the wife and describes how they are to treat each other. To violate the ketubah is to violate the marriage. Following this metaphor, the prophets charged the nation of Israel with marital unfaithfulness whenever they violated the Torah. Like ancient marriage counselors, the prophets rebuked the people in order to return them to their covenantal vows. Mikvah, Huba, and Ketubah. These three words are important words when it comes to the Jewish wedding. They were important to God when he descended on Mount Sinai, so they should be important to us. Your homework for next week's show is to stay engrafted, to stay connected with the Jewish people by reading and studying the weekly Torah portion, beginning in the 21st chapter of Exodus, verse 1, and reading through chapter 24, verse 18. Next week's show will be discussing something from that Torah portion. Another way to connect with Engrafted is to follow, follow us on Facebook. Find us at facebook.com forward slash engraft. And we're currently developing our web website, so more information on that next week. Thanks again for watching. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom! Shalom!